<laughs> Thank you all for joining us and, and welcome to the second uh, webinar of this uh, series. This is an effort uh, from uh, Chimi. And if you don't know our website, it's chimi.org.uk. Um, Chimi is the Council for Hospitality Management Education. Uh, we care about hospitality. We're mainly represented by universities in the UK, but our membership extends in Europe as well. Uh, and we do collaborate with a number of other uh, hospitality research uh, associations. The idea to create a, a PhD community has been uh, discussed in our executive quite often, uh, but it has been through the, work, the great work of, uh, of Alicia here, uh, who's been hosting uh, these, these webinars. And we are hoping that we are going to create a community uh, through these webinars. Now, it is very difficult for us, and I apologize that we couldn't email you the second webinar if you have attended the first one you would think but why didn't we get an email for the second one unfortunately for gdpr reasons every time we run one of this we delete the database we cannot keep the database but i think we have come up with a solution and i will post a link uh, into the chat after i introduce the wonderful barbara uh, and and maybe we can create a small uh, or big who knows linkedin group which will be mainly for uh, PhD uh, colleagues, PhD researchers in hospitality, in the context of hospitality. You might be labeled in your university as tourism or events or hospitality. What we care about is that you disseminate your knowledge and, and you have somebody to share so you don't feel alone uh, wherever you are. If you're researching hospitality, it's important to us that we keep on promoting uh, your good work and you find yourself in a community that likes what you do. Anyway, I will post the link in a second and I will remind you at the end in case we have any late comments. So my very big thanks to, to Alicia for hosting and a very, very big uh, welcome uh, to Barbara. Barbara uh, Tomasella. Now, Barbara, what I have to say about Barbara is that she, she's very experienced in corporate social responsibility as well as sustainability and, and, and marketing. And she has worked in consultancy. She's also an academic. She's done work in information technologies, a uh, very, very skillful colleague. Uh, where do I start? From e-commerce to entrepreneurship to, to CS CSR certification. Um, I am very, very excited to hear about abductive research. We all know about inductive and we all know about uh, deductive, but uh, it is a very new uh, way of reasoning and we need to know more about it, especially as it can have a great use in qualitative research. Barbara, welcome to this Jimmy webinar. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, the show is all yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, um, sharing my screen so I can share my presentation. Um, thank you. So um, yeah, welcome everybody. I'm pleasure to share the um methodology of my own um, uh, phd which i concluded last year alicia was my um, director of study so she knows the inside out about this research um so so what i'm going to talk about today so it should take around um, half an hour um is uh, i'm going to start by uh, saying a little bit more about the abductive philosophy um in order for you to familiarize with this uh, uh, research methodology and the way that i applied it in uh, in, in in what i branded abductive thematic analysis uh, so let's see if it becomes a thing in the next five years um and then uh, I'll, I'll i'll talk about the application on a case study which was uh, uh, the object of my phd um okay so so in terms of uh, basic concepts, uh, um, uh, abduction obviously is more uh, aligned uh, with uh, qualitative methods, but also mixed methods. So it, it's kind of in between. Uh, so there, there should be an element of uh, um, uh, qualitative research and I'll, I'll explain more about it. So this is kind of like a, a quick scan of the combination of uh, 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 ontology, epistemology, my own PhD. So I use subtle realism and the epistemology is uh, uh, pragmatic interpretivism because uh, I wanted to focus on values and attitudes of uh, small business owners. So that's why I, 
That's why I came um, uh, in choosing pragmatic interpretivism. Uh, um, the research strategy is therefore abduction, and um, I'll tell a bit more about it in a moment. And the methodology is obviously qualitative and multi method rather than mixed methods. But just to say that abduction is an overall philosophy and approach, the same as we hear about induction or, or deduction. So, how does it differ? So, we know that uh, deduction is uh, um, uh, usually an, appro an approach that is uh, the start from a set of hypotheses. Uh, so, uh, usually, uh, it's where you try to test uh, a theory through observation of the empirical world. Uh, conversely, so in the opposite direction, induction would start from observation of the empirical world um, and generates theories starting from that. So one of the tenets of induction is that uh, you are free from preconceptions, uh, very free from precon preconceptions. So that's one of the tenets that is highlighted in uh, ground theory, which is one of the most important approaches behind induction. Abduction sits in between. Um, uh, so it's, it's, uh, uh, it's the best of both worlds, as some people say. So it starts with an incomplete set of observation and proceeds to the likeliest possible explanation for the group of observation. Um, um, so in, actually abduction really starts from preconception. So differently than induction, despite it could seem very similar, it does start with a set of uh, concepts uh, with an existing theory. So it can be used particularly for theory extension. Uh, Eisenhardt, which is uh, very much known for those of you that uh, uses qualitative uh, methods uh, uh, for theory generation or theory extension, talks about it as uh, one of the methods. You can obviously aim for theory extension for induction as well, but the way that we want to distinguish uh, induction and abduction is that while for induction should be particularly used where there is no previous theory uh, to base on the consideration, abduction uh, really starts uh, from um, an existing um, theoretical, can start from an existing theoretical framework and, um, and then uh, uses observation and creativity to come out uh, with extension of theory or uh, the most likely uh, hypothesis for explaining uh, such observation. Um, so um, we can go back to this uh, afterwards if there are further questions on, uh, but hopefully I'll mention more in the course of the other slides. Um, I'm starting also from, uh, I'm putting differently than in other approaches, a mention on uh, quality assurance, um, because uh, I think that uh, one of the biggest mistakes in qualitative analysis is to uh, leave it towards the end, uh, the same as we, uh, um, as you would do if you're using a quantitative approach, you kind of tend to check at the end. But the, the thing with the qualitative analysis is that uh, it, it tends to be more creative and uh, therefore it should be introduced really early in the process. Um, um, I, it should include the consideration about research ethics and particularly qualitative analysis should include the positionality. Um, so um, this graph uh, which uh, uh, you might find in the publication that uh, uh, I, I cite at the end that uh, it's, it's where all this uh, presentation is uh, taken from, uh, talks about four criteria um, uh, that can be used in qualitative analysis and I, I did use for enhancing the quality of this uh, abductive thematic analysis approach. Uh, so credibility, um, whereby we use uh, uh, ethics, uh, triangulation of data, uh, so I'll mention it again when I uh, talk about uh, using multi-methods. Um, transferability, this is very important and linked to um, abduction. And the reason is that uh, 
the idea uh, behind abduction is that uh, uh, you are starting from um, uh, a theory and you're trying to extend it, extending it using a, a observation of the context. So the context is very important and aiming a thick description is uh, one of the um, uh, be, the important criteria behind uh, an abductive uh, uh, research approach. Uh, the other two are probably uh, uh, dependability and confirmability um, are uh, other important uh, things that I will talk about uh, when we mention the collection. Uh, dependability in terms of uh, uh, um, making sure that the research can be replicable, and this is one of the key uh, critiques to um, uh, qualitative analysis and confirmability, uh, the, uh, which is linked to the importance of the uh, reflexive uh, process uh, and also guaranteeing heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity in sampling. Um, so uh, moving on, um, one of the key things regarding qualitative analysis is uh, usually um, the use of uh, purposive sampling uh, uh, we uh, normally derive, uh, uh, we draw from a, sum, uh, from a population that uh, is known from the researcher um, um, uh, and subject that might have an interest in the research or a certain level of knowledge. And the purpose of that is that we need to generate insights uh, about uh, the phenomenon study. So we need to actually collect the data that are relevant to the research question. Uh, why am I spending time to talk about it in the context of uh, abduction or qualitative theory in uh, um, uh, general? So, um, we, if if we are saying that we are trying to extend theory to so to find new insight, how can we be sure that uh, uh, this sample is actually um, will respond to the purpose of our research? So that this is a, a key theory when we are trying to extend insights and going beyond the starting theoretical framework. So uh, my answer has been and uh, um, uh, to uh, add further snowball sampling. So um, uh, based on uh, the insights of respondents or informers, uh, I added uh, um, a detail to them about uh, um, further uh, respondents um, that could be added to the sample for their relevance and knowledge of the topic uh, being researched. Um, other practicalities that I just want to throw out there, mention in the in this chapter, and uh, um, which I think should be taken into consideration if you are starting a PhD research, um, you tend to research. Uh, 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 to, you, you have to try to, to choose, a, especially if you are doing qualitative analysis, a suitable uh, sample that you can, that you have time to access, that you can access, and that it um, can be accessed feasibly with the, the budget that you have available for research. So that's a, a comment that I think it's valid, not just in academia, but in the industry as well. So. Um, uh, number can, shouldn't be fixed in advance, so we should go until we reach saturation. Uh, I, heard, I remember that when I was starting my own PhD journey, some, uh, I heard some presentation with successful PhD with as little as uh, four interviews. Obviously, it depends on the research question, but you know, it, we shouldn't be too boggled down with the exact number, but we should aim for saturation. Other elements to consider is that uh, um, a PhD is a very long journey, especially the data collection and the data analysis and the reflexivity and all the elements. So be start early um, with, uh, uh, with considering all the elements such as introduction, uh, keeping research ethics, uh, your tape recorder, the memos, the research diary, all these elements uh, will be very important when you are um, analyzing the data and writing up. Um, and the research trail, which is what I'm aiming at, is one of the qualitative, um, um, one of the qualitative uh, criteria that I just mentioned. And it's becoming so. Uh, 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 my comment here is: uh, uh, start collecting early in MDivo all your evidence. Use it because it's a fantastic uh, software. 
that you can use to collect all data. Um, a further comment for those of you that, uh, like me, are early career researcher and trying to climb the next ladder, which is uh, uh, publishing, a research trail is becoming more and more important in qualitative journals. So um, make sure that uh, um, you collect all the evidence of your um, uh, research. Um, my choice uh, was, uh, um, uh, in, in terms of methodology, I aimed for uh, semi-structured interviews. Um, you probably know lots of these things. Uh, they are not structured, uh, uh, but they're not completely uh, free because you define the topic, uh, you have uh, presets of uh, defined questions, and prompts. Uh, so usually you start from a topic and a draft of question, you might proceed with a pilot and then um, you aim for the question that you have to open up for areas of discussion, uh, particularly for the areas that are more relevant to the participants. And the prompts uh, are equally important to allow for that. And um, obviously you don't use them if uh, that uh, was reached. Um, uh, obviously going beyond the prepare question, you know, it's a tricky part where you might want to, but maybe you don't have enough time. So finding the balance between um, structure and flexibility is important. I think using a pilot uh, in my case was very important. Um, okay, uh, so this is the, the kind of like the, uh, the five phases of this uh, Adoptive uh, uh, thematic analysis that I propose. So it's adapted from Brown, Brown and Clark, uh, and uh, it, it's uh, uh, it used uh, um, not just thematic analysis, but also qualitative content analysis. And my point, the point that I'm making in this adaptation, is that uh, because I use abduction, therefore I started with um, a, a set of uh, themes which came from the um, theory, I wanted to use it more at the beginning of the analysis, if you, if you see what I mean. Conversely, if you think about induction, you don't have the themes at the beginning of the analysis. So I wanted to reflect that. Um, so my phase number one was uh, using the themes from the theory. I, I then created an abductive code book uh, um, with, uh, with doing a qualitative content analysis of the many online documents available um, to me. So, um, uh, so this uh, uh, research uh, collects not just through um, interviews, but also use the online documents. Uh, apologies for not making it uh, uh, clear in the previous slides. Um, so um, the overall uh, data analysis uh, includes this initial phase uh, of creation of an adaptive code book uh, um, uh, with qualitative content analysis, um, and then uh, the kind of like typical phases that we see in thematic in, in, in uh, thematic analysis. There are various uh, thematic analysis uh, techniques I used. Uh, I aligned with uh, Brown and Clark. So. Phase two, transcribing and coding. Uh, phase three is merging codes. Uh, phase four, refining themes. And then finally, the writing up. So the following slides uh, kind of like look at these elements in uh, detail. Uh, so this one is kind of like the one more populated because maybe um, uh, there's less knowledge of what qualitative content analysis uh, is. So um, it is uh, this method, the qualitative content analysis, uh, again, is uh, um, uh, adapted from Kohlbacher in 2006. Um, so um, in, in initially the teams um, uh, I wrote, so the first uh, sub phase of this uh, qualitative content analysis is uh, um, uh, come started from the teams which are theoretically based because I remember again abduction starts from a theoretical um, uh, framework. Um, these, um, uh, these are my starting point. These were the starting point of the qualitative content analysis. The codes are generated semantically linked to the uh, uh, theme, basically using the tenets of a simple uh, uh, thematic analysis or, uh, um, or grounded theory analysis. Basically, you just go through the codes uh, 
and the documents and select uh, chunks of uh, information that are linked to your things. Um, uh, this can be done obviously, usually is done through software because uh, uh, by definition, uh, um, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, you have a high volume of uh, information, especially when you are going through online uh, documents. Uh, so uh, software can help uh, through word search function uh, with this phase. So more detail, uh, again, if you're interested in this, I have them in the, in, in the chapter um, cited in the previous slide. Um, so I, I, I ended up with a, a, an abductive code book, which was my starting point then for the uh, thematic analysis of the interview. So the uh, themes plus the codes that came from uh, the um, uh, quality content analysis of the online documents were a good starting point for me when I analyzed the uh, interviews. Uh, not just that, but I also used this uh, abductive code book uh, for preparing myself for the interview. So um, it helps with the triangulation, which is another tenet of, uh, um, of, quali of uh, um, qualitative procedure. Um, sorry, the second, so the second phase is the transcribing and coding. Uh, um, so very typical for thematic analysis. Um, uh, so transcription can be done in between interviews, uh, but you shouldn't be analyzing. So this is not like grounded theory, ideally, which kind of like builds uh, between, between interviews. Um, uh, and uh, uh, big suggestion, use memos, because uh, you, again, you need to, um, uh, to reflect on the, um, uh, on the dependency between concepts. And often these concepts come from insights uh, that, you, that are raised over a sustained period of time. Uh, the, for the coding, I used uh, a really um, useful uh, book from uh, Saldana um, that uh, uh, is very thorough and covers a whole array of coding. So I think for those of you that are not using grounded theory, um, it's, it's, it's a good companion for thematic analysis, which is a broad uh, um, um, uh, data analysis method that doesn't have strict rules such as as, um, as much as grander theory. Um, so the coding as usual is about extracting concepts from raw data and developing them in terms of their properties and dimensions. So uh, um, we obviously tend to use in vivo coding, which is a, a type of coding coming from, uh, from uh, grounded theory. So sometimes there are concepts that are very the very standout, they become a code themselves. But usually we, we have semantic coding, which is simply um, assigning a code to a concept according to its own literal meaning. So a semantic meaning. Um, the next step is merging codes. So you actually create other codes. Um, there is again an array of codes, and I think the the, the beauty from uh, from the book that I mentioned from Saldana is that you can, depending on your research question and your topic, find different types of codes. So in my case, for example, uh, beyond the semantic and the en vivo, uh, there was the value coding because I particularly looked at, at the influence of personal value on uh, corporate social responsibility. So. I use this kind of coding. Uh, and then latent coding, uh, which is uh, uh, when you start uh, by looking at the dependencies uh, between concepts at the inherent uh, re, um, meaning of codes. Um, this, sorry for this big graph is some examples, apologies, from, um, uh, from the case study that I will introduce actually in the next slide. So there's a bit of inconsistency. Uh, so just some example can be useful for you if, uh, uh, if you're new to, the, um, to these ideas. Um, um, so again, the, uh, the merging codes is when you start uh, reflecting on the relationship between codes. Um, um, so you 
sometimes so there are different examples uh, uh, you can find a latent meaning between two codes you can find maybe the two semantic codes should be put together you often find the variant cases so um, some uh, this is something that uh, um, we find in grounded theory as well. So paying attention uh, to um, those cases that are not uh, confirming the themes uh, and could unhurt uh, um, some uh, unexpected relationship. So, uh, and that's where you come up with latent codes. Uh, Guest et al, actually, it's uh, another book that I suggest for those of you inter interested in uh, abductive uh, thematic analysis. So uh, they wrote a, a textbook in 2011 dedicated with, to this uh, uh, method. Um, but the difference uh, from my own philosophy is that they start, uh, they use this method using, they use this method with a different uh, philosophy. So uh, I would say a, a new empirical, so more they, they hold stronger the initial framework. So as I can, as you can see, uh, the um, abductive thematic analysis can be used uh, in different ways. Uh, um, uh, at least the procedure is what you do with them that makes a difference. Uh, uh, the, the fourth step, I think, it's uh, quite important uh, and not often very commented on by textbook on uh, thematic analysis is when you refine the theme. So. How do you do, do you go about doing that? That's uh, uh, possibly the phase, uh, uh, the longest phase in any PhD. Um, I think a good suggestion is start thinking early uh, where you're heading. So re remember that in a PhD, you are making a contribution to academic knowledge or same as when you're writing uh, a journal article. Um, Sorry, I thought there was a question. Um, so how do you choose the themes? How do you refine them? What becomes a theme is very much linked to that uh, uh, final contribution uh, to knowledge because the salience of a theme uh, is judged in relation to the value to the story uh, um, told by the theme. Um, themes should be very distinctive and mutually exclusive. So. It's, it's the moment that you abandon themes or merge them together when you see that they are saying the same thing. So they should really be mutually exclusive. Um, uh, so one another uh, point of consideration linking back to this contribution to knowledge is that um, in qualitative research, you are situating your knowledge in established knowledge, particularly for adaptive analysis, which as we say, starts from pre-existing theory. Um, so it's important to, uh, to maintain uh, um, uh, the relationship with this, uh, um, with this existing knowledge and situate our added knowledge, which is, uh, as I mentioned before, the extension of the theory. So some of the, the new themes that you are coming up with should represent this extension of the theory. Um, and then the final uh, bit is the writing up. I just added actually um, uh, a, um, a scheme uh, uh, with team names. So it's, it's suggested you can either do it with a graph or uh, with a table. Um, so I, th I think it's useful because it helps uh, dividing very neatly concepts. Um, uh, it's not necessary. It could be criticized somehow for those uh, that think that uh, um, qualitative analysis shouldn't, uh, should be more, uh, um, uh, how can I say it, uh, more interpretivist. So um, the concept shouldn't be that clear. Uh, so I suppose like, depending if you start from a more um, stringent theory, if you, uh, 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 or for more interpretivist or constructivist philosophy, you might use this or not. Uh, if you have more questions on this, um, uh, we can expand. Uh, but I, I wanted to go on to the case study now. Um, so uh, as, I say, as I say, like the chapter that I wrote is based, is actually will be published next year. So uh, looking ahead of it. Um, so it's a, it, it was, uh, I, it, it's about uh, the topic of my PhD, which was uh, 
um, uh, CSR in uh, uh, small businesses in the food service sector. Um, so some data about the data collection, the sample population was uh, um, a known group of businesses to which I had access. Um, and uh, I, in the end, I interviewed and, and chose uh, 43 businesses, sorry, 38 businesses and uh, uh, and I conducted 43 interviews. There was a, a big volume of uh, online documents and uh, there was a small pilot of five businesses, which was very helpful again in for the final uh, um, semi-structure interview script. And the phases of the data analysis, just to give some uh, examples. So uh, I started for this, uh, from this abductive code book coming from a qualitative content analysis of those uh, 200 uh, um, uh, documents, which correspond to many, many pages. So obviously MVivo was essential. Uh, the transcription was uh, approximately for 45,000 words. Uh, and uh, so the second phase generated an initial uh, 558 codes, uh, which were then uh, merged into sub teams and uh, a more limited number of uh, uh, codes. Um, and then the refining of teams uh, came, uh, basically I, I, I came up with these uh, final six uh, uh, themes. Um, and the write-up, the final write-up, it was around 25,000 words. So uh, I actually divided my uh, discussion uh, from um, the findings. So there were two different uh, chapters just to give like a, a, um, a measure of, uh, uh, of the write-up uh, involved, uh, which was the final phase. Uh, so the graph actually again explained the different uh, uh, phases starting, uh, you have uh, multi-methods, so at the top archival documents and the interviews, uh, qualitative content analysis of uh, the um, documents, uh, and then the thematic analysis which uh, brought together the insights from the documents and the interviews as well. So. Um, uh, in summary, it's, uh, uh, it's a multi-method and multi-method uh, um, multi of data collection and multi-methods of uh, analysis. And uh, so that's the summary of my study. Uh, obviously, uh, as usual, um, limitation, uh, which are quite important, I would say, particularly in uh, qualitative research, because uh, you need to be aware of uh, um, the, the sheer fact that it's uh, non, uh, a non-generalizable theory. It's uh, very contextualized, and this is very much linked to uh, the, the meaning of abductive uh, um, uh, research and, uh, um, and the fact that uh, you can, uh, you're either extending theory or better say that you're actually creating hypotheses for future research, because uh, again, because it's not generalizable, it should be uh, according to quantitative minds uh, tested in the future, or uh, just be a good insight. Uh, for those of you that are constructivists, uh, it's a good in insight yes. in a context. I'm not sure. So that's about um, this uh, uh, abductive thematic analysis. So thank you for listening. and. Um, yeah, I'm open for questions. Thank you thank so you. much, Barbara. Um, thank you for that really insightful presentation on, on abductive research. So there is already a question in the chat box. I don't know if you want to stop stop the sharing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So the first question um, that we have in the chat is, can you tell a little bit about the timeline of your research? How long did each phase take and how long was the whole process? Uh, right, so um, the, um, as I say, the, all the qualitative content analysis, which uh, was before the data collection of the interviews, uh, uh, approximately took three months uh, between, you know, collecting all the documents uh, and then uh, running the qualitative content analysis and uh, kind of like uh, there was a, a, a minor write-up in the sense that you know, just the concept, and as I say, the 
um, uh, abductive uh, code book, um, which I then used and was very, very useful for, for, the, for the interview, for preparing for the interviews. Um, and then it took six months to collect, uh, uh, to do all the interviews. But I did the transcription in between, so within six months uh, uh, the transcription was done, and uh, and the initial coding, and then it took another six months, uh, I would say, for phase three, uh, four, and five, and uh, I won't tell you how long it took the writing up because <laughs> that's you know it took. I mean, I started then working, so I I, I don't think it's fair to say, but it, it probably took another six uh, to nine months, the write-up. And it's part and parcel of qualitative research that uh, it takes time to situate it in uh, in qualitative research. I think it's, uh, I, uh, I, I, it's, it's probably, um, it's inverted, while quantitative research takes more time up front in scanning the literature, coming up to the hypothesis, uh, but then, ideally, if you are a skilled quantitative researcher, the uh, data analysis should flow. Um, the opposite goes for qualitative analysis. Uh, it's just uh, the way it is. So it's uh, kind of like the timeline is inverted. Yeah. Thanks, Barbara. We have a question from Adam first, and then I'll come to Yanis. Adam, you want to ask your question? Hi, yes. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Barbara. That's very interesting. Um, very good indeed. I've also used abductive um, in my research, and I'm going to have to defend it very shortly. Um, can you maybe think through, or um, I'm trying to think the difference between, because I know this is something I keep on getting all the time, is this just not inductive research? So maybe that might have been a question of your viva or something you can maybe answer now. How would I, how would you justify this as ju not just been inductive research? I hope that makes sense. Uh, no, definitely, it's. Uh, uh, I, I think like there's uh, there's a, a growing body of research. Um, if you if you read the, the, the chapter that I, I I wrote, the one of the big uh, um, uh, what, there's a lot of critique out there about induction. I think you can start from that. A lot of the journal editors, one of them is Roy Sudabi. Which is uh, uh, um, which I met in a conference, and I cite uh, there and then, very critical uh, about the fact that induction is used uh, by everybody, uh, even when there is a preconception. So even when the um, so so I suppose there's more and more space for abduction, um, particularly as uh, uh, since. Uh, We've seen the critical turn in uh, a lot of the social sciences, in tourism, in uh, um, uh, you know. So th th that uh, there is a place for abduction, and you can simply defend it by saying, "I there is existing knowledge in the field that uh, I am uh, uh, researching." So. Um, I, uh, I felt uh, it was, uh, I, I actually wasn't worried about this aspect. Uh, maybe like the, um, uh, the, uh, the angle that I was coming at, uh, which was sustainability and corporate social responsibility was more, um, was more uh, populated with example uh, from abduction for, for the very reason that uh, uh, probably, uh, even if you're not familiar with CSR, you know that uh, the, the adage, uh, uh, um, global reasoning and, local, uh, and localized action. Uh, so you're aware that uh, CSR talks about, uh, you know, we, you are um, uh, working at global level, but you have to contextualize the knowledge. So because of that, uh, um, CSR and sustainability uses abduction uh, for the very reason that uh, despite we have general theories, we know that the context is paramount. Uh, uh, so when you are contextualizing knowledge, uh, um, then abduction is, uh, um, in my opinion, the best approach. Barbara, thank you very much. I shall use that in my vibe if I get asked. Thank you. Good luck. Well, Yanis, you want to ask your question and then we have a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. It's, it's related to, to the Viva stage that Adam, Adam uh, asked. And I'm thinking also maybe you can give some advice to, to supervisors. 
uh, and and the students are here as to how and I'm asking this because we also have uh, your your supervisor here. <laughs> um, how do you go about identifying uh, potentially uh, good examiners, especially external examiners, for something that is relatively a new, relatively new approach? Should I? Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Should I? Should I? Um answer this. So Barbara and I had uh, long conversations around who would be the right people to examine, not just externally, but also internally um, for her thesis. The colleague we decided on in the end was somebody who worked in the CSR field. Um, and because her research was also on values, it was somebody who also understood values, but also would be I, I don't want to use sympathetic but I say understanding of mm -hmm. of using a different methodology and the reasoning behind this and one of the things we worked really hard with in the thesis is making sure we had the rationalization for the abductive research so we had a very clear um, description of the process and a clear description of how all the phases were followed so therefore we made the methodology chapter I would say bulletproof, if, if that's the correct word for it. So, um, you know, to, to, and, you know, Barbara earlier spoke about, you know, keeping your evidence, that research trail. So that was really important also in, in justifying and supporting her, her methodology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, from a supervisor perspective, I think for me, the approach is having conversations with the researcher in terms of who might be um, suitable to examine their work, but also have them probably read some of these people work to see, you know, if that's somebody they would be comfortable with in, in the examination. I don't know if you want to share about your Viber experiences, Barbara. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm, um, I suppose uh, uh, it's good uh, to know where people are coming from. I, 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 I um, you know, being able to, um, understand where people come from uh, and what they wrote uh, helps in understanding their questions uh, and preempting, which is actually that you do in real life. Uh, you know, you, you, you check your Facebook, the, pro, the Facebook profile of new friends and stuff, you know, so it's a, it's a common thing. I would demystify the Viva, maybe because mine went uh, um, well, but uh, in, in general, um, can, I, it, can, I, can I say- it, Having a positive attitude, is very important can and going say, in with the idea of creating a debate. Can I say to the listeners that Barbara passed with no corrections? It's something she's too humble to, to admit. <laughs> so so email her for questions about why. <laughs> right, okay. um, yeah, uh, so in general, uh, um, the other thing that uh, I was mentioning before uh, that I was saying, the write up. Uh, um, as I say, I created that graph and created uh, uh, schemes because I, I come from a quantitative mind in a way, uh, having studied statistics. So I came to qualitative later. And uh, uh, so maybe that's one of the reasons why I chose an in-between method, one could say. Um, so I was actually criticized by the uh, rapporteur because or the comment was that, um, you know, because it's constructive, it's, you maybe don't need to actually identify so strongly the themes, comment the dependency, just by simply evidencing that something is of value in a conversation is important. Um, regardless, I think that um, the beauty of research and pragmatism is being able to talk with different audiences um uh, so um uh, definitely um uh, it, it's uh, uh, i think it's good it, it was good for me to transform my insights into an idea of a future quantitative uh, framework for those uh, quantitative minds that might want to read it mm -hmm. uh, and we know for sure that quantitative minds are harder to convince. So I, I, my, my recommendation is uh, um, to, um, to use a, a, an external that, uh, yeah, has got the same frame of mind. 
So that, that obviously the philosophy or uh, the epistemology of the person has to be similar, I would say. So. Thank you for that, Barbara. I'll just go to some of the questions in the chat since we have 10 minutes left. So the first one is, if preconception is part of abductive reasoning, how was it presented in your write-up? And did you try to articulate, did you try and articulate why you thought what you did, how, how you came across, have you come across examples of writing that do this? So I, I understand the first part of the question. So, um, so the, um, why you thought, I don't understand, did you try and articulate why you thought what you did? Uh, anyway, so I'll, I'll answer the first part. Um, it, it's uh, basically, I, um, I had a literature review which included, uh, which basically um, ended into a theoretical framework. And my knowledge was that uh, this framework um, informed the, um, the semi-structure, uh, um, uh, the semi-structure uh, um, uh, scheme of my interviews, um, but uh, then I came up with further insights. So, you know, the, despite I started from that theoretical framework, then I used uh, um, the interviews that were quite open. So there were aspects that I didn't consider uh, in the interview. So. Uh, there were insights that I uh, um, that helped me to extend uh, the theory, and that was my key contribution to knowledge. Um, uh, so, in general, uh, so I, I don't know if you want to add comment about uh, uh, a bit in the middle. Sorry, I didn't get it. Um, is it is it okay to try and ask Barbara? Yeah, yeah, please, yeah that was brilliant. It's Catherine. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think it's because some of the reading that I've been doing around abductive research is about how um, some papers that I've read, it's like a, a leap of, you know, a leap of the imagination. It's got this creative element. And so one of the things that I'm thinking about is like if our preconceptions influence the particular leaps that we make, how are people articulating that in their writing? Otherwise, they're like invisible leaps, aren't they? And so we're accepting, if we're saying that there's preconceptions in abductive reasoning, like how do we, is there a way of making them visible? Does any, has any writing that you've ever read done that? Yeah, was that, do you know what I mean? Well, again, the, uh, I, um, maybe we're, you know when 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 the um, uh, when you when you talk about uh, um, preconceptions, uh, a framework is a preconception. So uh, an existing theory. A lot of inductive study actually do start do use a theory to start from. So that theory is actually a preconception. So uh, without going that far, I mean, if you you can find many qualitative theories uh, into reason written from the philosophy uh, from the research strategy of abduction that actually do start from a, from a theory so that theory is a preconception and helps shaping uh, i mean uh, and had shaping then uh, the way uh, you write up because you have to acknowledge it so i mean i accept that you can do you know start from a theory uh, maybe adapt it to a completely new environment uh, uh, I don't know, circular economy, let's say an example that it's a, it's a, it's a topic area in my field that it's very, very new, but it's influenced by uh, the uh, supply chain theory and CSR. So, uh, you know, you could use some of the insights of CSR and supply chain management to create your uh, structure of uh, your, your interview script and, and then you analyze, but then you recognize the where you are when you write up, you are actually uh, ideally acknowledging uh, uh, the contribution to supply chain theory and, C and CSR theory, sustainability theory, if that makes sense. Because, yeah, it's a new insight. Um, you know, you have new concept, new adaptation, but I mean, the, the foundation and the preconcept is, uh, is uh, uh, still sustainability. It, it, uh, did, does that answer your question? 
Um, maybe it's my uh, interpretation of the word preconceptions, and I'm thinking about the role of the researcher in the thinking rather than just the theory. So like in abduction, there's this idea that these creative leaps are made in the reasoning. Like, you, you know, some writers talk about the Sherlock Holmes moment. Um, and so I'm just interested in if or how people articulate these creative leaps, not biases, somebody's put biases, not necessarily biases, but the creative leaps that are made that must be based on our own experience or imagination or something that happens that makes us see a certain thing. And I just wondered in, in, in any papers that are using abductive approaches, if people have explored, you know, have tried to articulate that, yeah. Uh, in uh, to to um, I think that uh, um, I would say that the leap of creativity is uh, um, is is also present in the inductive way of analyzing uh, data in induction. You know, uh, insights. The, the difference I think is that people that write about run the theory wanted to sound really scientific. If, if you, you know, so I think a lot of all these methodologies, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I mean, I can be, I, I shouldn't be quoted here. A lot of these uh, methodology depends again. Right. They, they come from whoever wrote them. So ground the theories, they try to compete with quantitative uh, uh, theories and be very structured. You know, axi uh, um, uh, uh, axial coding. Uh, you know, all those methodology categories. Uh, but then again, isn't there uh, creativity in, uh, in 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 the in the um, let's say uh, in the process of coming up with teams? So there is always an element of creativity. I, I think reading, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, Sharma uh, writes about uh, constructionism in the context of grounded theory, and she is used and cited by people that write uh, abduction. I think like the, the texts about abduction that I read are, because uh, um, for example, abduction was used in health studies. Uh, uh, imagine that, I mean, in a context, for example, health, uh, uh, Brown and Clark wrote their uh, text uh, uh, about health psychology, health. Uh, um, uh, so the one is, is rifle with the quantitative uh, um, uh, studies that, that you could use in sight. And uh, so uh, uh, same for me, sustainability is very much quantitative based. Uh, so maybe from a quantitative person, this uh, uh, process of uh, inventing and coming out with new codes uh, is a leap of creativity. So I would be worried and I would look really what's behind uh, mm, uh, those comments. Thank you for that, Barbara. So we're coming to a close. Just a um, few more comments. Um, there's been some requests for you to share the reference list from your presentation today. So if you can, um, are you able to share that that reference list because you've highlighted some good references? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, Barbara, if you if you send me email me those references, I will add them in the description of the video so people can easily access them from there. Yeah, and then uh, they're all in my uh, chapter. Please read it. It took me a year to write it. So. We, we can put a link to your chapter as well. <laughs> exactly. And then in the chat, there's been um, lots of thank yous for your presentation. And also there is a nice comment from Helen. Say, I love your resistance to force objectivity in some <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um, a lot of um, very interesting and thank you. So Barbara, I want to say a massive thank you for you, you know, for taking the time to share to share your research. And I think your passion for this clearly came across in, in this presentation and I'll hand over to Yanis now. Uh, yeah, just to say thank you to, to Barbara for her time. Thank you to Alicia for hosting and moderating. Um, just to remind you at the very beginning, I posted this link that I just posted again. It's a new a LinkedIn group uh, so that we can create a community for you 
all of you who have just joined and I keep on accepting you are founding members effectively. And uh, we're hoping to work with other associations as well. It's all about researchers within the context of hospitality so you can share ideas. If we have new researchers in abductive research, you can make small communities within the, uh, the hospitality community. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for, for joining us. There will be another webinar coming up in February where we're hoping you will be contributing more. More information will be posted on the Chimney website and the LinkedIn group. And of course, Alicia, I'll hand that back to Alicia to talk about the conference because we're hoping we have a lot of content for PhD students at the CHIMI 2021. Alicia, over to you. Yep, definitely. So we will be hosting CHIMI 2021 online. Um, it's from the 12th to the 14th of May. So please have a look at our website, www.chimiconf.co.uk. Um, and the first day of the conference is a doctoral colloquium, so please um, submit your abstracts. So there's uh, the submission link is open, um, and this is going to be a very exciting event for you, where you you get to participate and not only share your research but get feedback from from your peers in in the field. So you know, while some of us have completed our doctorates and have you know a, a work in academia, we still see us as your peers because you know I can learn from you also from from your research as well as you know um the new things things you're doing so i learned you know a lot from my doctoral students i learned a lot from working with barbara and, and with abductive research so it's important for us to build this peer-to-peer -peer community um as part of that so please you know join us for that online conference it'll be really really great to have you have you there so it's now six o'clock so i want to say thank you everybody for your time i'm a stickler for time um, <laughs> so thank you all for your time and look forward um, to see you at our next webinar and look forward to the link from Yanis uh, from this event. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.